So we are waiting for people to uh, come back from the breakout rooms, and then we can start with the uh, next um, tutorial. Okay, great. So I think that uh, everybody is back to the main uh, room. So it's my uh, pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Zach Miller, who is a uh, PhD student in ecology and evolution at the University of Chicago. So it's very early for him. Uh, it's like about 7 a.m. So I want to thank him for being uh, with us so early and uh, he will give a tutorial on uh, linear algebra. So please, Zach, if you want to uh, share the presentation and unmute, great. Let's see here. All right, great. Everyone see that? Thanks. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Jacopo, for the introduction and the invitation. Um, so yeah, so the, the aim of this hour long tutorial is to give a, a very brief survey in linear algebra. Um, it's a, you know, a, a, a field that has um, a lot of sort of terminology and, and kind of uh, foundational um, baggage. And so um, the idea here is that we're not gonna be able to go through um, too many proofs today. We're not gonna be able to go through too many computations, but hopefully to to kind of go through the important concepts um, to be able to, to use some of these ideas in, in the biological context. Um, I'm gonna sort of start with the real foundations and we're going to sort of um, work our way up to some more kind of um, complex calculations and, and, and sort of ideas. Um, so, you know, the, the beginning might be review um, for many people, but, but um, bear with me and hopefully we'll, we'll get to interesting stuff for everyone. Um, and, um, and, and linear algebra, I think I'll make my little pitch, is, um, is, is definitely the kind of material, it, it shows up everywhere and it shows up in so many different sort of guises that it, it's really worth seeing it um, repeatedly, thinking about it in different ways. So um, ho hopefully maybe, maybe this will be a, an opportunity to also get a sort of new perspective if, it, if it's content you've seen before. Um, so any, any um, sort of introduction to linear algebra starts with um, the idea of a vector. So um, for our purposes, a vector is an ordered list of numbers. So I've shown a few here. Um, and just a note on notation, um, often uh, vectors are denoted either with lowercase bold-faced letters or, or sometimes with lowercase letters with a little arrow on top. I'm going to stick to bold-faced letters, but I'm showing both here just because you might see it. Um, you might see them written different ways. Um, so we, we think about vectors as, um, as a sort of ordered list of, of numbers. Um, our vectors will have real or complex numbers as, as their components. So these um, sort of sort of constituent numbers, the entries in the vectors are, are uh, what we call components of the vector. Um, and, and we'll, for the most part, be talking about vectors with real components, but sometimes complex components. Um, and we can also think about vectors graphically, right? So this is the first kind of, uh, already we're seeing that there's two ways to look at them. Um, we can think about them sort of as these ordered lists, or we can think about them as um, a kind of arrow in space with a direction and a magnitude. So um, I'll go back one second. So this u here is corresponds to this uh, vector here, three, two. You can see that it's um, you know three in the first coordinate and two units up in the second coordinate. Similarly, the second vector uh, v is this negative one, one. Okay, so, so this is the kind of uh, geometric picture that we've probably all seen before. Um, and then we can do operations with our vectors. So um, vectors of the same size, can be added component-wise. So for example, if we want to take that vector u and v um, and take their sum, we add them um, 
just, just add the components. So 3 plus negative 1 becomes 2. 2 plus 1 becomes 3. So the sum of our u plus v becomes a new vector 2, 3. Um, that can also sort of live in, in the same uh, geometric space. Um, graphically, we think about this as adding the ve vectors uh, tip to tail, as people like to say. Um, so we, we take the first vector u, and then at its tip, we place the tail of the second vector, and we get the, the sum uv. Um, this uh, vector addition, because it's, it, it basically comes from um, the addition of the, of the um, scalar components, the, the real or complex values in here, um, the, the addition follows all the normal rules of, of, um, of the addition of those numbers, right? So uh, namely, it's uh, commutative, distributive, associative. So we can, we can reverse the order of the sum here and we get, we get the same um, vector out. Um, so vectors can also be multiplied by scalars, right? So we can take a um, just a, a regular old uh, uh, real number here and multiply it by the vector u. And what that does is it just multiplies each component of the vector u by that scalar. So here our u goes from being um, 3, 2 to 3 halves, 1. And in the picture here, you can see that we're, we're basically scaling its length. So when we multiply by a scalar, we're stretching the vector, but not changing its direction in space. Um, the, the only sort of exception when I say not changing the direction is we can sort of flip the vector by multiplying by a negative number, right? So now we're just taking the vector and um, it's remaining in the same sort of line in space, but the orientation is pointing the other way. Um, so this is just the case of negative one half times u. Um, so Combining these two operations, right, the component-wise addition of vectors of the same size and, and multiplication by scalars gives us a, a slightly more general um, notion of a linear combination. And this is a really foundational concept in linear algebra. Um, so over here on the right, I, I'm showing that if we take any two vectors, u and v, from some um, set of vectors that we're going to call a vector space, and some scalars, c1 and c2, then we, we can write very generally the linear combination c1 times u plus c2 times v. And you can see here the sort of component-wise definition of this. So the outcome will always be a new vector w um, that's also going to be in our vector space, right? So we, we can say that the vector space is um, closed under linear combination. So it's the, the set of all vectors that we can get um, by making linear combinations of, of, um, of the vectors we start with. Um, OK, so let's talk a little bit more about linear combinations. So, so again, linear combinations generate new vectors from old. Um, given a collection of vectors, so, so you give me some vectors, the set of all other vectors that I can express um, as li linear combinations of those is called the span. Um, so this is this is another important sort of um, idea that we're going to rely on a lot throughout this um, tutorial. So um, just to kind of get a sense, I mean, to get a feel for using this term, uh, here we, we say that w is in the span of u and v, right? So if I start with these two vectors u and v, I can produce a new vector w by taking um, a sort of weight, uh, a linear combination of u and v, a sort of weighted, weighted sum of u and v. Um, and what that sort of looks like is I, I, again, I start with my u and v. Now I multiply them both by scalars. So I stretch v a little bit. I shrink u a little bit. And then I take these um, new scaled vectors, and I sum them, and I can produce w. Okay, So because uh, w is expressible as a linear combination of u and v, it's said to be in the span of u and v. So t is another example of a vector in the span of u and v, just to make clear that um, you know, we can, we can use negative numbers to make these vectors point in the other direction. So um, v, I mean, this t is, is again just produced by scaling and then summing u and v. Um, and, and we can also sort of strangely use um, span as a verb as well as a noun. So we often sometimes say things like u and v span the entire plane. So um, we'll, I'll kind of, you know, Get to the, skip to the punchline here and say that 
I, I show you W and T, but really we can produce any vector that we want that, that um, can be drawn in this plane by taking combinations of U and V. Um, and so this leads us to another really important idea, which um, is, the, is this, this idea of linear independence. So if, if we take a, a set of vectors S um, and none of the vectors in that set can be written as a, a linear combination of the others, then we say that S is linearly independent. Um, if that's not the case, then, then S is linear depend, linearly dependent. So if, if there is a vector, or in that case, there, there might be many um, vectors in S that can be written a, a, as a linear combination of other vectors in S, then the set is linearly dependent. So a few more examples. So in this picture, if we consider the set just of U and V, this set of, of those two vectors is linearly independent. Okay, And that's because if we take just V on its own, um, the only way to sort of take linear combinations of V by itself are just to scale it. So all we could do is sort of shrink or stretch this V, we can never produce U by doing that and, and vice versa. Um, the set U and W is linearly independent for the, so those are the same reason, um, but the set U, V, W is linearly dependent now. And that's because as we, as we just saw, we can produce W as a linear combination of V and U, okay? Um, so we're, we're gonna see this idea again of linear independence again and again. Um, and, and linearly linear independence um, leads right away to a, another concept. Um, that's that's the concept of a basis. So a linearly independent set of vectors that spans a vector space. So we, we specify some some vector space. For example, the plane here. Um, and if we have a, a set of vectors that spans it, so they can generate through their linear combinations, they can generate any other vector in the plane. Um, and, and they're linearly, linearly independent, then they form a basis for that space, okay? And the, and the idea of a basis is sort of um, um, an idea of a kind of minimally sufficient set of vectors, right? So the, um, the, the spanning part tells us that these vectors are enough to generate the entire space under consideration. Um, the linearly, linear independence part tells us that none of them are redundant, so if we add more vectors and, and the set becomes linearly dependent, that means basically we have more vectors than we need to, to span that space. Um, so as some examples here, the, the set UV is a basis for the plane for R2. So um, I, I use this kind of fancy R right to denote the, the real numbers and the two to say basically the plane, the um, set of, of pairs of real numbers. Um, UW is also a basis for R2. UVW is not a basis for R2. And, and the reason is because UVW, while it does span R2, so it can, we can use that set to generate any um, vectors in R2, it, it's a linearly dependent set, right? So it's not minimal. It it's, um, sort of has redundant vectors in it. Um, and U is, is clearly not a basis for R2 because of course U can only generate, we can only use U to generate vectors that lies sort of on this line in the direction of U. So we can't generate any vector in, um, in the plane. Um, so the idea of a basis is actually one that is, I think in many ways kind of familiar. So even if you haven't really looked at linear algebra in this sort of formal way before, um, anytime we sort of work in a, in a coordinate system, um, we, we are usually thinking about a, a, a basis Called the standard basis. So um, even the kind of axes that we often draw for like a 2D or a 3D space, um, we can think of as basis vectors. So this, this is the standard basis. Um, we, it's often convenient to work sort of in reference to the standard basis. So here we, we often use E, I to denote the ith standard basis. So E1 is the vector with just a one in the first component and zeros everywhere else. E2 is the vector with a one in the second component and zeros everywhere else and so on um, for, for whatever kind of uh, space that we might want to, to look at. And so in this picture, right, the, these are just vectors of length one in the direction of the usual sort of coordinate axes. Um, and then when we write 
um, for example, whenever we do sort of Euclidean plotting, right, we, we think about kind of ordered pairs of numbers like AB, and, and we can think about these just as linear combinations of the standard basis vectors, right? So a scalar A times E1 plus a scalar B times this vector E2. Um, and, and then that just looks like in component form, uh, looks kind of like this, A0 plus 0B. So all this is to say is that th these concepts are, are ones that we actually kind of work with all the time. Um, okay, so, so, so far we've relied a lot on the 2D picture. Um, the real beauty of linear algebra in a lot of ways, and, the, and one of the reasons, I mean, the, the sort of primary reason it was developed is to kind of deal um, with a common notation and a common set of tools um, to deal with um, very high dimensional spaces. So spaces of sort of arbitrary dimensions. So, you know, in physics, we might think about um, uh, the, the space of sort of physical coordinates, like, you know, 3D space or something. In biology, we might think about um, our, our space, our vectors as, as being maybe um, the abundance of different species in a community, right? And so um, if we go to a diverse community, we might have hundreds or thousands of species. And so we might be dealing with sort of vectors that represent the state of the community um, that, that, are hundred, that have hundreds or thousands of components. We might think about the concentration of molecules in a cell, whatever. The kind of nice thing about linear algebra is, is the tools we're gonna develop can accommodate you know, anything from one to two to three to 10 to 100 to 1,000 sort of components at a time. Um, so while it's useful to, to draw the, the 2D pictures and I'm really not much good at drawing anything beyond the 2D picture, um, it's useful to, to right away start thinking about um, dimensions beyond or sort of other than, than the two-dimensional picture. So, um, Let's take a moment and think about now the three-dimensional picture, right? So we have of the vectors S and T. Um, do these form a, a basis for the space R3, so for the three-dimensional space? Um, it turns out no. Um, so as a kind of counterexample here is, is a vector you, you can try as hard as you'd like. You, you can never write this vector as a linear combination of the other two here. Um, now, I, I sort of just pulled that vector out of there, and, and we'll see as we go along kind of how we address this question more systematically. But um, this is to say that in, in, in um, the space R3, two basis vectors is not going to cut it to span that space. Um, but we, we shouldn't say that um, S and T are not a basis generally. So they're not a basis for R3, um, but they are a basis for some space. And, and they're a basis for what we can call a subspace um, of R3. So in, sort of geometrically, they form a basis for a plane, a two-dimensional space that we can think of as kind of embedded in R3 that, that um, goes through the origin of the three-dimensional space, but um, it, it is a kind of lower dimensional space within it. Um, so, so that's a perfectly good sort of vector space in its own right, right? It's closed under your linear combinations. So if, if I take uh, linear combinations of S and T, I'm going to produce new vectors that are in that subspace. Um, but, but these two vectors don't span the entire R R3 uh, space. Um, and so I, I may have already slipped and used this word because it's really hard to avoid it. Um, but th this leads us to in the important concept of, of dimension. So we're, we're used to thinking about dimension kind of heuristically. Um, and linear algebra gives us a, a very kind of nice and precise way to think about dimension. So um, if we have a vector space, um, it's defined by, by a basis. So there might be multiple, there, there are in general many choices of a basis that define um, some vector space, but given a basis, we, we've specified a vector space. Um, and um, that the, the size of that basis gives the dimension of the vector space, okay? And, and the, um, the sort of way we've defined a basis, so this fact that um, the basis has to both span the space and be linearly independent, these two kind of conflicting requirements, right? So one is this like requirement that the, the set of vectors are sufficient to, to span the space and the other is that they're kind of minimal. Um, these two requirements um, mean that the, the dimension is a unique number, right? So any basis for, for the, the same vector space will have the same number of elements and so the same dimension. Um, okay, so I've shown you that we can take two vectors and combine them to um, produce a new vector in a, as, a, as a linear combination. 
Um, but how do we kind of go backwards? So if, if I have some arbitrary vector and I have some basis, um, how do I represent that vector as a linear combination of the basis vectors, right? So how do I kind of write it in the, in the space defined by that basis? Um, so this problem, while it seems kind of like a sort of intellectual exercise, it's, it's equivalent to solving a system of linear equations, which is, is really one of the most important tasks that, uh, that we have in, in um, science. So, so linear systems of linear equations show up just about everywhere. Um, they, they are historically extremely important and really motivated the development of linear algebra. Um, and so, so let's kind of see quickly that these two um, exercises are really the same. So, um, so here the graphical picture is that we have some V and U, we have some W, and I want to find what are these two scalar coefficients C1 and C2 um, such that I can write W as a linear combination of, of U and V. Um, okay, now let's look at something that at, at first glance is totally different, right? So here's a, a system of linear equations. So this kind of um, problem arises all over the place. Um, and, and we have here three unknowns, X, Y, and Z, and then we have um, coefficients for each of those unknowns. And then um, on the right-hand side of the equation, we have these um, just, just like scalars. Um, so what we can sort of see if we write down the, the um, system in, in this kind of nice, nicely formatted way, is that um, these coefficients two, four, and seven all get multiplied by x. These co coefficients one, four, and two all get, or negative two, all get multiplied by y. These coefficients negative one, two, and negative three all get multiplied by z. Um, what that kind of suggests is that um, this kind of ratio two, four, and seven are fixed, right? So by kind of changing values of x, we can sort of um, only change these values sort of in lockstep with each other. Um, and, and we can sort of see that we can actually rewrite this equation with the, this 2, 4, 7 now um, as a vector and this x as a scalar coefficient out front. So we can really recognize um, this system of linear equations as, a, um, as exactly the sort of linear combination problem we were talking about, right? So now here we have some vectors, 2, 4, 7, 1, 4, negative 2, negative 1, two and negative three. Um, and we want to find a linear combination of them such that we um, produce this kind of target vector or this, this like arbitrary vector, negative one, four, three. And so we want to know what are these coefficients x, y, um, and z. Um, and to, to do that, we need to um, introduce the idea of a matrix and develop a little bit of machinery here. But um, first, maybe if, if anybody has any questions um, at this point, before we keep going, uh, feel free to raise your hand. Um, yes, so uh, yes, so I think it's a good moment to, to ask question. If anyone wants to uh, ask one either in the chat or raising the hand, I think we can take a couple of minutes to summarize. Any question? No, I think it's a sign that everything is extremely clear. <laughs> All right, great. Then maybe, yeah, then, then we'll keep, just keep moving. Um, okay, so yeah, so, so we're going to pause on that question for just a second to introduce this kind of new machinery. Um, so now we, we're, we're looking at matrices. So a, a matrix is just a rectangular array of numbers. So before we were looking at vectors, we're switch, which were sort of just a list of numbers. Now we're just looking at kind of a structured array of numbers. Um, so the, the notation we're going to use consistently is that a matrix is denoted just by a capital letter, so like A, B, or C. Um, you can see here matrices can, can kind of have different sizes. So that's the kind of the first important thing to talk about. Um, the, the size of a matrix is given by the number of its rows. So um, each, each of these kind of like things across here we call a row. Um, and the number of columns, so each sort of like uh, of these stacks of numbers here is just a column. Um, and the, the kind of form, usual format that we give for the size of a matrix is like rows by columns. So this matrix down here, A, for example, is two by two. 
This one in the middle is three by three, and this one on the right is three by twos. Okay, so the, the rows and columns don't necessarily need to agree with each other. Um, and um, when we talk about matrices, we usually talk about elements. Why, why we use elements for matrices and components for vectors, don't ask me. Um, but the, the elements of a matrix are these uh, numbers that make it up, right? So, um, the, so here we, we can talk in general about like an N by M matrix. So a matrix with N rows and M columns. Um, and its entries are denoted by a little a i j. So i telling us which row, so a number between one and n, and j telling us which column, a number between one and m. So for example, this uh, one here is in the first row of b and the second column. So we would call that like b i, I mean b one two. Um, this 10.5 here is in the second row and second column of c. So we might call that c two two. Um, OK, so like as with vectors, um, we can sort of operate on matrices. We can add matrices of the same side um, element wise. So this is much like the addition of vectors, right? We add these two matrices. We take 2 plus negative 1. We get 1 um, in the, the sort of 2 in, in, the, in the 1, 1 position. In the 1, 2 position, we add 3 and negative 3. We get 0 and so on. Um, matrices can also be multiplied by scalars. So um, as before, we multiply by a scalar, and that means that every uh, element of the matrix is multiplied by that scalar. So this negative 2 just goes sort of inside the matrix to each entry, um, and, and um, you can follow the, the multiplication there. Um, so again, the, these, I think, um, lectures are going to be available later. So if I fly through any of these examples, you can always go back and, and take another look. Um, and a note that, so again, we have the sort of no, uh, notion of a linear combination here. So linear combinations of matrices, um, as with vectors, produce new matrices. And what that actually tells us is that um, really matrices form their own vector space. So uh, we can take any two matrices of the same side, produce linear combinations, we get a new matrix of the same size out. Um, OK, matrices come with two new and slightly more interesting operations, um, transposition and multiplication. So um, the transpose operation, which we write with this little t here, sometimes confusingly because it looks like a power, but this t is really a, a special operation um, that takes an n by m matrix and just basically flips it on its axis. Um, so the outcome of this transposition is an m by n matrix um, where the now the ij entry of our new resulting matrix is was the ji entry of the a matrix. Okay, so here's an example. If we take this matrix A and we take its transpose, um, now we just sort of flip it, and um, what was the the sort of two one entry the a two one becomes now the one two entry so that, that's where this two 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 point two goes from here to there um, so, so that's um, fairly straightforward matrix multiplication um, is worth talking about for uh, a minute longer um, so we can multiply matrices but the the sort of multiplication operation is is somewhat different than um, than how we extend addition so Whereas addition of matrices works element-wise, multipl multiplication of matrices is kind of a new thing altogether. Um, so if we take two matrices, A, which is n by m, and B, which is p by q, um, we can multiply these two matrices um, only if the number of columns of A, so this m, is equal to the number of rows of B, this uh, p here. OK, and, and we'll see why that in, in a second. So in this definition um, for matrix, matrix multiplication, um, the product of these two, A, B, um, each of its entries, so the A, I, I mean, the I, J entry, for example, down here, um, is defined by taking the sum of, of many products over the entries of um, A and B. So we take, um, again, to get the the ij uh, element of, of AB, we take 
the um, AI1 plus B1J plus AI2 plus B2J and, and so on. So there's kind of in compact summation form, um, we sum basically over all of the um, columns of A and all of the rows of B. So that's these, this K, this index of summation um, for, for whatever I and J uh, um, we're, we're interested in. Okay, so here's that in action very, very briefly. Um, so to get the um, product of these two matrices, let's first think about the, the, the first element of the product, right? So the, the one, one element, which here is a four, um, we get that by multiplying the, basically the first row of, of the first matrix by the first column of the second matrix. So we have this two times negative one plus three times two, uh, that should give us negative two plus six, which is four. Okay, um, we can try to do this for any of the, the element, I mean, any of the uh, elements of the, the um, resulting matrix. So I'll just go through one more. So this five down here, which is in the um, second row in the first column, we get by multiplying the um, second row of the, the first factor matrix and the first column of the second factor matrix. So we get a negative one times negative one plus a two times two, and that gives us five. Um, so it, it's worth spending a little time practicing this if it's not something you're familiar with. Um, I'll leave the formula up here um, for a moment longer. Um, okay, so matrix multiplication um, it again works a little bit differently than normal multiplication. Um, and one thing right away that's a bit different is now the, the multiplicative identity. So the element um, such that if we take B times the multiplicative identity, we get B back. So it, in normal multiplication, that's just played by the one, the, the number one, right? So if we take 10 times one, we get one back. Um, in matrix multiplication, that identity element is, is what's called the identity matrix. And it's a matrix, a special matrix that looks like this. So it's um, an, an N by N matrix that has ones on the diagonal and zero everywhere else. Um, and so it's worth kind of trying it out for yourself. But if you multiply any matrix by this I N, um, you'll get just the, the, the original matrix back, okay? Um, it's worth noting that this um, identity matrix is a, is a very special example of, of a kind of more general a type of matrix called a diagonal matrix. So it's a matrix that only has non-zero elements on its uh, diagonal. So on the for the elements like AII, um, a, you know, A11, A, A22, only when the, the I and the J equal each other. Um, and, and we'll see some more diagonal matrices soon. Um, and, and another note, um, another sort of important fact about matrix multiplication is that it's associative. So if we have A times B times C, we can multiply A and B first, or we can multiply B and C first, it doesn't matter. Um, and it's distributive. So if we have um, A times the sum of two matrices, we can distribute that, that uh, multiplication across the sum, but it is generally not commutative. So A times B is not equal to B times A. Um, and, and this is maybe made um, maybe you might have already sort of seen that this kind of has to be true because of the way we define matrix multiplication, right? So it depends on um, the, the sort of interior dimensions, this M and P um, being the same. So if we, if we take now B times A, then we have to worry about whether Q and N are the same, um, these, these sizes. So that's just to say that um, a, a times B will not generally be the same as, as B times A, um, even when the sizes work out, actually. Okay, so um, matrix multiplication, um, we, we can actually now go back to our vectors for one moment. Um, and um, matrix multiplication kind of apply, gives, gives us some interesting concepts when we look at vectors. So um, first, if we take the transpose operation, we turn our usual vectors. So I've been writing vectors as columns, and that's just conventionally how we think of them as sort of, um, vectors are, are almost like matrices that have n rows and one column. Um, but if we take the transpose of a column vector like that, we get a row vector, which is now um, kind of like a one by n matrix. Um, and if, if we take two vectors and we apply the transpose, 
um, in, to one of them, um, now we can actually multiply them using matrix multiplications. So for example, if we take a, a vector V and a vector U that are the same, um, that have the same number of components and we transpose the V, um, then we have a one by N vector times an N by one vector, okay? Or, or um, essentially an, an, a one by N matrix times an uh, N by one matrix. And so we can just multiply them using the usual matrix multiplication rule. Um, this is often um, called the dot product, or it's an example of an inner product. And, um, and the, the, you know, you can see down here, we just end up with V1 times U1 plus V2 times U2 and so on. Um, and, and this is a really sort of important um, operation that, that will come up all the time. Um, one, one very interesting connection here worth seeing is that the inner product or, or dot product of a vector with itself, so V transpose V um, is equal to the Euclidean length um, or the norm of the vector squared. So if we take V transpose V, we have V1 squared plus V2 squared plus V3 squared. That should be a squared, sorry, here. Um, and, um, and then if we were to take the square root of this, we would get the normal sort of Euclidean length of the vector. Um, and if we take the um, inner product of two different vectors or even the same, um, the, the uh, product is, is actually going to be a function of their, their lengths and their angles. So we can explicitly sort of write it as a function of their lengths and angle. So V transpose U um, is gonna be equal to U transpose V. So this operation is, is um, symmetric in this case. Um, and and this will be equal to basically the length of u times the length of v. So this, the square root of the um, inner product u transpose u, the square root of the inner product v transpose v times the, um, the cosine of their angle. So in this picture here, right, this, this inner product that comes out is just a function of basically the length of u, the length of v, and then this angle here formed by the two vectors in space, um, which, which holds even um, in the kind of higher dimensional picture. Um, and, and importantly, if um, V transpose U is equal to zero, so if this inner product is equal to zero, um, that can only happen for non-zero ve length vectors um, when, when this cosine term is equal to zero. Okay, and so what that means is that the angle between these two vectors is, a, is a, basically a 90 degree angle, so that it's a right angle. So this idea of orthogonality, or orthogonality generalizes the kind of idea of being perpendicular or at right angles um, that you've probably seen in a geometry class. Okay, so um, that's a, just a little aside. Um, now back to matrix multiplication. Um, it's often useful to, to view matrices as sort of bundles of column vectors. Um, and when we, now let's just think about multiplying a matrix by a column vector, right? So we have a matrix sort of, of arbitrary size and we're gonna multiply it by, by a column vector, an M by one matrix essentially. Um, if we kind of think through the matrix multiplication, what we see here is that this V1 is gonna multiply all of the um, elements in the first column of A. The V2 is gonna multiply all the elements in the second column. The V3 is gonna multiply all the elements in the third column. Um, and so we can actually sort of rewrite this matrix multiplication as V1 times this sort of vector now formed from the first column of A, V2 times this uh, vector, column vector formed from the second column of, of A and so on. Um, so really taking this product A times V is, is giving us a linear combination of the columns of A. Um, okay, so this is bringing it all back to sort of the, the question we had, you know, maybe 20 minutes ago now um, about sort of representing a, a vector in a basis or equivalently solving a general linear system. So these two things are both equivalent to the matrix equation, AV equals B. So we have um, a matrix A, the columns of which are our basis vectors. We have a V, which is a vector of unknown coefficients that we'd like to, to figure out. And we have a, a B, which is kind of an arbitrary target vector. Um, so, if this were a sort of normal equation in scalars, right? If this were just like four times V equals two, the way we would solve it is we would multiply each side by one over four, right? By, by one over whatever this coefficient is. Um, so because we're dealing with matrices, we, 
um, we can't quite do that, but we, we sort of want to find a, um, a new matrix, an inverse matrix for A, such that when we multiply this inverse A times A, um, we just get V on the left. So, so very much sort of in um, analogy to what we would do solving just a, um, a normal kind of linear equation. Um, so here, what I'm writing is that this A inverse times A gives us the identity matrix. Um, so if we could find such a matrix, then um, solving this, this uh, uh, system of equations would just basically turn into a matrix multiplication, right? We could just take um, that matrix A inverse, multiply it times B using the, kind of out, the formula we just saw, and we would get V equals A inverse B. Okay, so um, that's a nice idea. Um, and then the, the kind of question is, um, you know, when can we find such an inverse matrix and how do we find it? Well, um, if, if A is, is an n, n times M matrix, there will be a unique solution of this form um, whenever the columns of A comprise a basis for RM. And, and that um, comes from kind of the fact that we were um, seeing earlier, which is that um, we, we need the, the columns of A to sort of span the whole space in order for there to be to, to be guaranteed that there is a linear combination and we need them to be a basis. We need them to be um, linearly independent. Otherwise there, there's a sort of degeneracy here. So to, to find a unique solution, we need those columns to comprise a basis for RM. And then the kind of geometric picture that we saw sort of guarantees to us that there'll be a, a unique solution um, here. But um, we'll, we'll, we'll look a little more at that in a minute. So. Um, this is just kind of a restatement of what I just said. It's a really important kind of fact to keep in mind. Um, in practice, uh, we can write down formulas for the inverse of A. They're very cumbersome and they're not really even worth looking at here. Um, in, pra in, um, in practice, we, we, we compute inverses and, and generally solve matrix equations using um, numerical algorithms. So maybe you've, you've used these algorithms in R anytime you've solved for a matrix. Um, and it, it's sort of a kind of thing best left to uh, numerical algorithms. But um, it is worth thinking a lot about when we expect there to be an A inverse and, and sort of being able to work with the inverse of A symbolically. Um, okay, so one other way of looking at matrices is um, as representing linear transformations um, from one vector space to another. So what's a linear transformation? A linear transformation is a kind of operation um, that maps a vector space into a different vector space. Um, it, it encompasses a lot of the kind of mappings that you might dream up, like rotating the vectors around the origin, scaling them, you know, that is like stretching them, um, reflecting them, and the composition of these operations. Um, the, the sort of formal uh, definition for, for some function to be a linear transformation is that whatever this function is, it, have to, it has to distribute over sums um, and when we multiply, uh, when we take the function of some scalar times a vector, the scalar has to come out of the, the transformation. Um, so, so all of these um, operations that I mentioned up here satisfy this property. Um, and um, it turns out that uh, if A is an N by M matrix, then the, the sort of multiplication A times X actually describes a linear transformation from the space Rn to the space Rm. And so any linear transformation can be expressed this way and any matrix can be thought of as corresponding to a linear transformation. So here's a, just a little picture. If we take um, some vectors and we, we map them now to, um, the, to a new space by multiplying by A. So we take the vectors that I've shown here, we multiply them by this matrix I show above um, we get some some new vectors. So this this uh, one one vector here kind of becomes um, gets sort of rotated and stretched. Again, this like negative one negative one gets rotated and stretched. So we can see there's the, this composition composition of these different operations. So um, I just draw four vectors. Of course, there are infinitely many vectors in this space, and they all get sort of rotated and stretched and and scaled um, by this operation. Um, so, so this gives us kind of another meaning for um, the matrix inverse. Um, if we take 
um, one matrix times another, what we're doing is we're basically just applying sequentially two different linear transformations. So we're like first rotating and stretching one way, and then we're rotating and stretching um, some other way. Um, and in particular, if we if we take multiply multiply by the matrix inverse, um, that matrix inverse is a new transformation that undoes the old transformation. So if we take we, we first took our original vectors, we multiplied them by A to get this kind of new, um, um, to, to be mapped into this new space. Now, if we multiply by um, A inverse, we actually just map back to the original vectors. Okay, so, so here's the inverse matrix. So again, this is kind of two rounds of matrix multiplication that takes us from our original space to a new space and then sort of back to the old vectors we started with. Um, a, a linear transformation um, has, so we, we start with some vector space, we apply a linear transformation, um, and we're, we're going to generate some new vectors, right? Um, the, the set of all possible vectors, all the vectors that we can generate um, by taking this linear transformation is called the range of the transformation. So in this kind of picture, we start in this Rn space, and we're mapping through this Rm space. And there's going to be some subset of vectors, potentially the whole RM, but maybe just a subset um, that, that our um, initial vector space maps into. And this is called the range of the transformation. And the dimension of this, um, of this range, so this, this uh, range may be, um, again, the full space RM, or it may be a subspace. And its dimension is the rank, is called the rank of the matrix A or of the associated transformation. Um, and, and equivalently, that's going to be the dimension of the span of the columns of A. So um, if we take, take a look at the columns of A, the, the number of linearly independent um, columns of A, essentially. Um, the, a, a closely, very closely related concept um, is that if we, we take the set of all vectors in our original space um, such that a times x is equal to zero, this is called the null space of A. So these are all the vectors that get mapped to zero basically by this linear transformation. And the dimension of this space, so now this is a space that lives in our, in our, um, in our domain in Rn, um, the dimension of this space is the nullity of A. Um, and and a, a very important result in linear algebra that unfortunately we don't have the time to really prove or, or to do justice to is that the rank of A plus the nullity of A is equal to, um, to um, M, to the, the um, dimension of the um, space that we're, we're mapping to. Um, and, and closely related to, to both of these concepts is a, a characterization of when A it's possible to write down an inverse for a matrix A. So A is invertible, that is, it has an inverse. Um, if and only if the linear transformation associated with it is one-to-one. -one. So if um, every vector in our kind of initial space has a unique vector in the, um, in the uh, range that it maps to. Um, and, and basically because of this uh, rank plus nullity statement above, um, we can equivalently say that a matrix A is invertible if the rank of A is equal to M or if the nullity of A is equal to um, zero. And, and one kind of immediate thing we should see here is that um, for, for any of this to really be possible, we need the, the N and M to be the same. So if we're mapping from, vector, from a, a, a vector space of one size to a vector space of a different size, um, we're never gonna have this one-to-one -one mapping. So, um, what that kind of tells us is that only square matrices, only matrices that are n by n, um, are going to be invertible. Okay, so um, that's that's uh, several kind of characterizations of when we expect there to be an inverse. And again, we're not really getting into the computation, but that's okay. Um, but none of these are really sort of practical criteria that are easy to check, right? They're kind of nice ideas, but um, how do we actually sort of check if a matrix is invertible, if it's, if it, what its rank is or what its nullity is? Um, well, one way to do that is to use a kind of fundamental summary statistic for matrices called the determinant. Um, the determinant of A is a, it's a kind of nice 
number that shows up everywhere, it, it kind of describes in a kind of hand wavy way how volumes are scaled under the linear transformation associated with matrix A. Um, but, it, but it has one really important property that relates to our, our question about inverting matrices. Um, and, and so here, I'll just show you a, a little example. So it, there's an, an analytical formula for the inverse of a two by two matrix that's actually not too bad to write down. I wouldn't recommend trying to write it down for any bigger matrices, um, but a two by two we can do. And, and it's just um, on the right here. And you'll see that in this formula, one over the determinant of A appears. Okay, so this number the determinant of A um, that is, is basically a polynomial in the entries of A. In general, it's a kind of complicated polynomial. So again, I, I recommend, um, you know, usually we, we just um, use sort of numerical uh, algorithms to calculate this number. Um, but in any case, it, it appears in these formulas. And um, so here, this might lead us to suspect that the, the inverse of A is not defined when the determinant of A is zero, right? Because then this um, becomes one over zero. And, and this is just kind of a, a, a hunch that we might develop, but it turns out to be a, a, a generally true fact. Um, so a matrix A is invertible if and only if the determinant of A is not equal to zero. Um, and again, there's a kind of nice formula for the determinant for two by two, but quickly the formula becomes quite complicated um, as we go to higher dimensions. Um, okay, and so, so now that we kind of have the determinant in hand, we get to our final topic um, that we're gonna have to treat a little quickly, my apologies, um, which is really um, one of the most important in linear algebra, which is um, the, the idea of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, so the eigenvalue problem. Um, so this, the kind of question we're trying to answer in the eigenvalue problem is which non-zero vectors have their orientation unchanged under linear transformation? So I, I take some vectors on the right here and I apply some linear transformation. They get mapped into new vectors. A few of them, very special ones, um, don't change their direction. They are only scaled, right? So, so this vector that was originally pointing up gets kind of rotated and stretched. Um, but this vector that's following the one one line just got stretched and not rotated. Um, and so the linear, the, the, I mean, the eigenvalue problem asks, um, which are these kind of special vectors that just get stretched? Um, and, and kind of more symbolically, we have this eigenvalue equation, um, which is a times x equals lambda x. And this lambda here is a scalar that we call an eigenvalue. And these um, x's are, are sort of unknown vectors. So we want to figure out what are solutions, what are x's and lambdas um, that make this equation be true, that make it true that the multiplication by a just returns us the, the original vector we had possibly scaled, um, kind of stretched, but not, not rotated or um, reflected or anything like that. Um, so these, these unknown vectors are called eigenvectors and the scalar here, lambda is called the eigenvalue. Um, and, okay, so we can try to solve this problem. Um, and what we might kind of naively do is to say, okay, well, let's, let's get all this stuff on one side of the equation. So we can take our AX, subtract um, lambda X. So we get this equation on the second line, AX minus lambda X equals zero. Um, and then what we might do is we might say, okay, well, let's factor out the, the X, that vector X. Um, and to do that, because um, we're, we're doing matrix multiplication and, and here we have to be a little bit careful, um, when we factor out the X from this um, scalar, we, we need this scalar like lambda to still kind of be compatible with um, addition with the matrix A. So we, we get lambda times the identity matrix, right? So this A minus lambda times the identity matrix times X if we distribute this x, we get back the, the, the equation above. Um, okay, so, so now this is really a matrix equation, sort of like the ones we looked at before. So we have a, a matrix, a minus lambda identity times a vector x equals zero, which is a vector of zeros here. So it's just some target vector like we talked about before. Um, but it, but it's, it's not quite as simple as, as um, 
before because we noticed that um, zero, the, the vector x equals zero is always kind of a trivial solution that solves this problem. Okay, but we're not interested in that zero, that trivial solution. We're interested in non-zero vectors. Um, but if if this matrix A minus lambda identity is full rank, then the discussion we just had um, tells us that zero, because zero is a solution, it must be the only solution, right? Because the mapping would be one to one. So that would imply that if zero is a solution, it's the only one. Um, and so what that tells us if, is if we want to find um, sort of non-trivial solution, non-zero x's, um, then we need the, um, this uh, matrix A minus lambda identity to be singular, to be non-invertible, um, because we, we need the transformation now to be not one-to-one. -one. So that's actually kind of nice because it tells us that um, what we need is we need the determinant of A minus lambda I to be equal to zero, right? That's the criterion we, we just mentioned for a matrix being um, non-invertible or singular. And this expression here, determinant of A minus lambda I equals zero is called the characteristic equation for A. Um, the left-hand side is a polynomial of degree N, which we call the, the characteristic polynomial. So again, this determinant here, um, there's a, a sort of formula for it and it's going to be a big, big N degree N polynomial in the entries of the matrix inside. Um, but then now we can just sort of apply some results from, from algebra. So if we have a degree n polynomial, that, um, that equation is going to admit <clears throat> n solutions, n roots, if we count them with multiplicity. We count repeated roots, potentially. So there are up to n distinct solutions, n distinct values of lambda. And each value of lambda comes with a kind of associated x, an associated eigenvector. And we call these together um, an eigenpair. Um, but one important caveat is that we have to admit um, complex eigenvalues and eigenvectors potentially, right? So even so, as soon as we start having an n degree polynomial, you know, even if it's just a quadratic or something, it might have um, complex roots, um, and we have to allow that. Kind of geometrically, the, we can think about that as like um, th there's no guarantee that a, a linear transformation has um, real um, eigenvectors. And, and one example is I, I mentioned that rotation is an example of, um, of um, a linear transformation. So rotation would be like take a vector space, rotate every vector by 10 degrees. Um, if we did that, it's, it's fairly obvious that there, there is no, um, <clears throat> there's going to be no vector that um, doesn't have its direction changed, right? Um, so, so in that case, there will only be complex eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Um, if, if our matrix A already is non-invertible, um, so matri matrix A on its own has a rank K less than N, then there are going to be um, zero eigenvalues. Um, so basically there are going to be Vs, choices of V or, or eigenvectors um, such that A times V equals zero. So basically if we go back to our characteristic equation, we don't even need this lambda um, identity to make determinant equal to zero. So there, there are just choices of, um, of eigenvectors that already kind of satisfy that equation. Um, so those, those are going to be eigenvectors with associated eigenvalues of zero, and the rank is going to be equal, the rank of the matrix will be equal to n minus the number of zero eigenvalues. So this gets us to our, our final kind of big laundry list of statements here um, that if is worth spending a little bit of time thinking about. Um, but hopefully, at least very quickly, we, we've discussed the ways that all of these statements are equivalent, right? So A being invertible, the columns of A forming a basis for Rn, this uh, system of linear equations having a uni unique solution for any B, the columns of A being linearly independent, the determinant of A being non-zero, the rank of A being n, the nullity of A being equal to zero, and A having no zero eigenvalues. Um, so I think we're, we're just about out of time here. Yes, so uh, go ahead, go ahead. We have, we have uh, five or 10 minutes more if you need. Okay, so, so one last um, is that 
that's kind of so that's the, the eigenvalue problem in, in a um, nutshell. And um, I, I mentioned that the eigenvalue problem has potentially n distinct eigenvalue, I mean, n distinct solutions, basically, n distinct um, pairs of eigenvalues and eigenvectors that, that um, satisfy it. Um, and so we can imagine collecting all of those eigenvectors um, as columns of a matrix Q, so shown down here, and all of their associated eigenvalues in a diagonal matrix lambda. So again, this diagonal matrix is just a matrix that has um, like AII or, or lambda 1, 1 equal to something or, or something non-zero, lambda 2, 2 equal to something non-zero, and all the off-diagonal um, elements equal to zero. Um, so, so we can form these two matrices, OK? Um, and if we form these two matrices, we have now this kind of bigger matrix equation, A times Q equals Q times uh, lambda, um, that unfortunately, I don't think we have time to really kind of walk through this, the multiplication of these things. But this is a way to sort of simultaneously write all of the solutions to the eigenvalue problem. Um, so that, that uh, formulation that we had before, AX equals lambda X, um, this is a way to sort of write all N solutions to that uh, at once. Um, and we can see that if this matrix Q is invertible, if it has an inverse, then we can multiply by that inverse um, to get down below A is equal to Q times this um, matrix big lambda times Q inverse. Um, so again, this is only possible when Q is invertible, and that's only possible when you know one of those many characterizations holds true. Um, so what it, what it really means, uh, or one thing it means is that um, we, we must have N um, linearly independent eigenvectors, okay? Um, when, when that holds true, we can write A in this way. Um, and what this tells us is that the matrix A is completely specified by its eigenvalues and eigenvectors, right? It can be written um, solely in terms of its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So this question that we started with that looks sort of like kind of a funny question ends up being a, a complete characterization of a matrix. Um, and so if we know all of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, we know the matrix, we know everything about it. Um, but the eigenvalues alone actually um, are often highly informative about a matrix. So these, the, the set of eigenvalues is called the spectrum of A. Um, and in many, many cases, for example, in biology, in, in, in looking at um, different models, uh, dynamical systems, the eigenvalues alone of A um, contain a lot of a rich amount of information about A. Um, so an important example that I'm sure you will see in these talks if you haven't seen before, um, and this is just to give you kind of a little hint of the value of of thinking about these eigenvalues and eigenvectors is that if we have a matrix difference equation like xt equals um, a times xt minus one plus b, so basically a system where at each new time we, we um, get the state of the system by multiplying the old state by a matrix, um, this kind of system converges to an equilibrium if and only if the maximum absolute value of the eigenvalues of the matrix, which is called the spectral radius, is less than one. Um, very closely related to this, um, the matrix differential equation dx dt is equal to ax plus b, um, which is again a very kind of general, very sort of useful um, model, um, converges to a steady state if and only if all the eigenvalues of a are negative. So these are cases where just knowing these n numbers um, is kind of totally sufficient to tell us about the behavior of a system that really has n squared parameters that, that's governed by this whole matrix, um, but these eigenvalues are actually sort of incredibly rich source of information about it. Um, all right, so I'll stop there. Apologies. Um, no, no, no. Over no. By a few. <laughs> they, I don't know if there's time for any questions. Yes, uh, I think we have like uh, two, three minutes for questions, and then we can take. Uh, a short break before the next lecture. So please, if you have any question, uh, you know uh, how to ask it, either post it on the chat or raise uh, your hand.
So there was a question um, a little bit back on the eigenvalue asking if um, the scaling factor that uh, it appeared in equation was the eigenvalue. Um, yeah, you can ask the question. Uh, yes. Shamorin. Hi, uh, in one of your slide, you showed that, yeah, the direction remains same, but only the rotation of that vector changes. And that's for the eigenvalue, no? You, you showed that? Yeah, so like in the slide um, that I have here, so hmm. these so vectors- the eigenvalue lambda is the scaling factor here? Yes. The yeah. magnitude? Exactly, yeah. So the lambda is the, is um, for the eigenvalues, the lambda is the scaling factor. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so just for example, like in this picture here, this vector like one, one, or, or this vector, sorry, is, starts as two, two, and it becomes three, three. So the mm -hmm. one of the eigenvalues of this matrix is three halves. It's scaled, this, these um, vectors become scaled by three halves when we multiply by A. Yeah. Uh, there is another question by um, Augusto saying, how do we determine the eigenvalue of a rectangular system if it is even doable? That is an excellent question. So um, yeah, I, I actually kind of omitted that. So um, right for, for, for the, um, for this kind of interpretation that I gave where this vector has its direction unchanged under multiplication by A, that really implies that um, that the uh, matrix must be square, right? If 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 this vector on the left ha has a different size than the vector on the right, then it, it doesn't even really make sense to talk about the um, the orientation being unchanged. But that said, um, there is an analog to the idea of an eigenvalue for a rectangular matrix, um, and that is if we take um, now the matrix A. Um, transpose A. Um, so this, this matrix is, we can think of as kind of like a covariance matrix of A, um, but it's a, a matrix related to A that, that now is, will be square. Um, and so being square, it will have um, eigenvalues. And so uh, we can look at the eigenvalues of, of this matrix, which is related to A. Um, and these are called the singular values of A. Um, and, and they, um, the, the theory of the, of the singular values of A is a little bit more complex. We don't really have time to get into it, but, um, but they, they, they kind of tell, you, tell us much of the same information as the eigenvalues would. So um, yeah, if you're interested in, in learning more about that problem, um, the thing to look into is the singular values of A or the singular value decomposition, which in many ways is sort of analogous to the eigenvalue um, problem. Uh, Thank you. Okay. So is there, uh, well, I think, uh, um, well, let's ask, let's answer the last question by the Badonita, and then I think we can take a short break, stretch legs, get a cup of coffee, um, and uh, um, before the next lecture. So the Badonita asks, what happens if we get an eigenvalue equal to zero? What will be its geometry uh, representation? What will be its what, sorry? Uh, it's geometry, I guess it's geometrical representation. I see. Um, yeah, so, so an eigenvalue equal to zero um, is, is basically a, a direction. So this matrix A um, is a, a direction where the multiplication by A just maps us to zero. So we can kind of think in this picture that um, if, if this eigenvalue for um, say this direction here was zero, when we multiply by a, we would the matrix would just become. I mean, the uh, vector here would just become zero. So we would kind of just map to the origin. So these are directions where um, multiplication by a just kind of kills the vector that's there. Um, and and what this tells us is that x is in the null space of a. So um, yeah, I'm not sure if that's hopefully that that gives some sense of the geometry. Okay, great. So um, uh, I think uh, it's a good time to uh, to stop. Thank a lot, uh, Zach, very much for the uh, 
of the very nice tutorial, which again, it will be available um, on YouTube for the next generation to come. Um, so thanks again also for doing that very early in the morning. And uh, of course, uh, um, uh, what we're gonna do now is to take a four minutes break. Uh, we're gonna be again randomly assigned to breakout rooms. Uh, so feel free to chat with whoever you are assigned to or to um, take a break, stretch your legs, and we'll be back in uh, four minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, Zach. Good morning. Hi, Stefano. Hey, Stefano. Good job. <laughs> so I, cut, I caught only the last few bits, <laughs> but thank you for oh, doing that. <laughs> yeah, my favorite part. Yeah, that's great. Just, just to mention that we are uh, live stream on YouTube, so. 